our everything, our truth, our way to follow, our, our direction, our, our standing, our good, solid footing. Lord, the world needs that right now, and I pray that you would cause us to realize that we stand on the rock this morning. And as we exalt your name, we know that you're the name above all names. We can't get to you any higher than you are, except we're talking about in our hearts today. In the temple of our hearts, our bodies are your temple, the temple of your spirit. We pray that there you, you truly are sitting on the throne this morning. And if not, Lord, make it so that we come to that place of surrendering the throne of our hearts to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. Hey, before you're seated, turn around and greet one another. announcements for you. Um, first off, we, we just want to let you know that we, we as a staff, uh, both would love to pray and, and we want to pray for you and for your families. And so there's a few ways you can be involved with that. If there's a prayer need that you have, uh, someone you know or love has a, an issue going on in their life, uh, just take a moment and fill it out on this connect card. And uh, when the uh, offering basket comes by, you can just drop it in there. And uh, what we do from there is we, we have two lists. One, if, it, if it's a confidential request, you can mark that down if you want someone to, to follow up with you on a phone call or maybe you're going in for surgery and uh, you just want someone to, to be with you and pray at the hospital. We're, we're here and we're available for all of those things. We just, we need to know what the needs are. So uh, take a moment and, and jot those down. And uh, we generate a couple lists. There's one that's just for, for the pastors and staff. And then we have another one that goes to our our prayer team, and uh, they lift up every single need by name uh, that comes in. And so we just want to join with you and uh, for you in prayer. And uh, if you want to come and pray with us, it's open to everyone in the church family. We meet on Wednesday nights at uh, 6 o'clock, and then again on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock, uh, right outside the sanctuary in the prayer room. So that's available for any that wants to come uh, and pray. Uh, Sunday nights, it's about an hour. Sunday nights, it's about 30 minutes. Uh, since it's right before our evening service. But uh, again, that's open to everyone. We just want to pray uh, with you and alongside of you. So please uh, put down your prayer requests to come and pray with us. Um, also, our youth have a few things going on. Uh, there's going to be a, a youth night coming up on February the 24th. That's going to be for both junior high and high school. Uh, we combine it into one big fun night and we bring in a guest speaker and uh, have worship and we do a few games and activities. And of course, there's free food for the kids. So. Uh, just jot that night down and bring in the young people that you know. 
And uh, moving into the new year, we adjusted our youth groups a little bit. So on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock, we have our junior high ministry. And then Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., uh, our high school ministry meets. Uh, they come in here for worship, and then they get dismissed and go upstairs to their to the youth room. So we just wanted to let you know that. Uh, if you have any young people, know any young people, spread the word, have them come and get connected and discipled. Uh, youth ministry has been, been my life and my world for, for 14 years here at the bridge, and uh, I am just so thankful that God can use little knucklehead, wild 13, 14, 15 year olds to do radical things for, for his kingdom. So don't give up on them. I know they may be rowdy, they may look weird, smell weird, but man, God has a purpose and a plan for every junior high and high school student that is out there. So uh, get your students connected here. Uh, it's, it's vital to their growth and relationship with the Lord to be around other like-minded uh, believers their age. So uh, please have them be a part of uh, what the Lord is doing here in our youth ministries. And then lastly, we want to let you know that our baptism Sunday is right around the corner. It's going to be February the 10th, and it will be immediately following our 11 a.m. service. So for you guys, that means if you want to come back at about 1230, uh, we'll be setting up that little portable baptismal out there. Fred will get it heated for us, and uh, we'll just have a great time rejoicing uh, and celebrating for those who have found new life in Jesus Christ. So if you're getting baptized, we just invite you to put your name down on a little sign-up sheet. We have a brief meeting before just so we can explain everything to you. Um, if you'd like some in-depth information on what, what baptism really looks like, we have a pamphlet out there. But uh, the very simple way is it's just a public declaration of your love for Jesus. And baptism is symbolic. When we, when we dip you in that water, it's death to the old you. And as we raise you up, man, we're just asking the Lord to pour new life into you once again. And so it's just... A symbol, symbolic of dead to the old you and you're being raised to life in Jesus Christ. So if you've never been baptized, I encourage you to do so. It'll be a very special day in your relationship with the Lord. So again, if you'd like to be baptized, put your name on the list. But please come back and celebrate with us at 1230 on the 10th. Um, that's it for the announcement. So we have some guest worship today. I pray you enjoyed it with Terry and Nancy. It's always great to have them out. Uh, they have a little table in the foyer if you want to get some CDs, some music to listen through, some good worship throughout the week. Please stop by and see them after service. But at this time, we're going to continue in worship as uh, we give to the Lord this morning with our tithes and offerings. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you, God, for the new life you've been bringing to many hearts and many souls, God. And we, we look forward, Lord, already to the Baptism Sunday. What a special day that will be for so many, God. And we pray in advance, Lord, for those that you'll bring to this place that don't yet have a relationship with you, God. We pray that you would very quickly draw them into your kingdom. That they, Father, would experience new life and forgiveness in you. And God, we pray for our church here. We ask, God, that we would continue to be truly a, a light in our city. And that, God, we would truly reach the lost and teach the saved through this place here at the bridge god so we, we give to you this morning we ask god that you would be blessed by your giving we thank you lord for those who faithfully give to you and to this place and we ask father that you would meet every need we have here at our church and so we give to you this morning and we ask these requests in jesus name amen, amen. <laughs> Oh 
I can go if you won't be with me, always with me. So I'll surrender my way, I'll surrender my life every day. So Lord, help me rest in you. Um, 
that you realize that you've only recently jumped on the bandwagon of the Los Angeles Rams, and you said, oh no, the Super Bowl's in just one week, so I better get to church this morning and get some forgiveness if, uh, if they're going to win the Super Bowl, because we're going to need everything in order to do that. But all, all joking aside, a friend of mine, um, speaking of the Rams, he asked me to share this with you this morning. He said that uh, he has two tickets to the Super Bowl. Um, versus the Patriots, of course, in Atlanta this, this coming Sunday, next week. Both box seats, he paid $2,500 uh, for each ticket, but he didn't realize it when he bought it a year ago um, that it was going to be on the same day as his wedding. <laughs> so he sent me a note and told me to tell the congregation today that um, if anyone's interested, get with me after the service. He's looking for someone to take his place. The wedding is next Sunday at 3 p.m. <laughs> Her name is Cindy. She's about five foot six. Loves to cuddle, likes to cook. She'll be the one in the big white dress. Well, the good news is, no matter which one of those categories you might fit in this morning, you came to the right place. Because today, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to do a deep dive on what Jesus wants for you and what might be the most powerful topics in the Bible. Are you ready? It's forgiveness and freedom in forgiveness and compassion in forgiveness. So as you open your Bibles uh, this morning to Matthew chapter 18, let me share a couple things. Uh, first of all, who's enjoying the one-year Bible? Raise your hand. Let me see a show of hands. Fantastic. That's outstanding. You know, I I'm hearing so many great things getting so many texts and so many messages from people that are just devouring the Word of God. And there's no better way to do it than, than in the one-year Bible. Um, I want to encourage every one of you to stay disciplined, stay focused. You know, January's already gone. It's only about 11 more months till we start hearing Christmas songs again. Um, but think about this. You will have read the entire Bible by that time. So praise God. Also, it's a privilege, if you're brand new to the bridge this morning, I want you to know it's a privilege to stand up here uh, in support of our senior pastor, uh, Chuck Woolley. Um, he's taken a little bit of time off, and for those of you that it's your first time, or maybe you come here regularly, you miss Pastor Chuck. If you miss him like I do, I want to encourage you to just go to Facebook, go to the Bridge Calvary Chapel on Facebook, pull up one of his messages, and just press play. It's amazing. And, uh, and you get to hear the sound of, of Pastor Chuck's voice. I, I told him the other day that at night I put my headphones on when I go to sleep. I put my headphones on, I put on Pastor Chuck, and I love to fall asleep listening to him teach the Word of God. And Chuck said, so let me get this straight. My teaching puts you to sleep. And I said it does, but it's kind of like when Jesus calmed the sea, right? You know, so... Um, but he is one of the greatest teachers, if not the greatest teacher that's ever come into my life. And I encourage you to stay connected with our pastor. Let's get down to business this morning, because what you're about to hear over the next few minutes is one of the most important things that you'll ever come to know in your walk with Christ. Forgiveness is something that's very easy to talk about. It's, it's not even hard to read about it. You open the Bible, it's everywhere. But when we have to put into practice these biblical concepts, and we have to apply them in the real world with real people, it suddenly gets real different, doesn't it? Let's look into the Word of God, chapter 18. Let's start with verse 21. And then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times, and Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, the master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees and imploring him he said have patience with me and I will pay everything and out of pity for him the master of that servant released him and he forgave him the debt but when that same servant went out 
he found that one of his fellow servants owed him a hundred. And seizing him, he began to choke him and he said, you will pay me what you owe. And so this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and he went and he put him in prison so that he would pay his debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and they reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you. Here's the kicker right here, folks. Underline this. If you do not forgive your brothers or sisters from your heart. The great theologian C.S. Lewis said that everyone agrees that forgiveness is a lovely idea until we actually have something to forgive. You know, as head coach of the SoCal Coyotes every year, some of our rookies, I get a chance to deal with, with a couple of our knuckleheads every year. Inevitably, one of them will find my way to my office and, and, and have something to say about the subject of forgiveness. We had a player a few years ago. He told me that his school would not give him his degree until he cleared a debt with the library. Now, he'd had some other issues. Um, he'd been kicked off the team, and he'd had some other challenges. They reinstated him, but long story short, he'd been kicked out of the system, and he'd taken so long to pay the debt that, that he couldn't pay it over the phone anymore. They told him he had to come down and pay it in person. He wouldn't get his degree until he paid it, and the debt was a whopping $10. <laughs> so he did what all of us logically would do. He went and got a big jar. Apparently, this is a big thing with millennials. Um, I, I've seen other people do this at the DMV. I've read about this, heard about this. It's the first time it had ever been presented to me. He went, got a big, a big jar, filled it with $10 worth of pennies, and then poured honey into the jar. And then he stormed down to the campus, and he went into the library, and he said, here's your $10. And when he smacked it down on the counter, it broke. And now there was pennies and honey all over the place. And now he had not only an issue with the people that he owed the money, but he also had an issue with the campus police. So as the young people say today, SMH, shaking my head. So we just compound the problem. I told him he got an A for ingenuity, but he got an F in forgiveness. And I'm not sure who was the first one to coin the phrase, don't get mad, get even. But my experience has been that the people that do this, they just multiply their problems. And they end up even needing more and more and more forgiveness. Unforgiveness is a monster. I want you to think about that for just one second. It's the opposite of Christ. It is the very opposite of Christ-like. Unforgiveness says, you owe me. You did this to me. He or she has done this to me. Now you will pay for what you've done to me. Unforgiveness says, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm just going to turn a cold shoulder to you. I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to punish you because you've hurt me. And then I'm going to go around and tell others what you did. And those of us who have been married a long time, man, we... We're pretty good at putting honey in the penny jar, aren't we? We know that, uh, you know, your wife says, hey, I cleaned the house today. And in the back of your mind, you're going, yeah, but the, the blinds are still dirty. And then the, the husband says, hey, I washed the car today. And the, you're in the back of your mind, the wife's saying, yeah, you could have waxed it too. And then you hear the husband say, well, you know, you know, I've been trying to pray a little more. And she's saying, yeah, and you could pray a whole bunch more. <laughs> Unforgiveness. And maybe we're not putting the honey in the penny jars. Maybe we're just cussing them out in the back of our minds. Maybe we quit talking to them. I'm not over my hurt feelings, so therefore, I'm going to hurt you until I am. Maybe we just give them the cold shoulder, or we just turn around and tell other people about how bad these people are, and we plant those seeds of, of anger and animosity. And we just stand back and watch it work because we want everybody to know what a bad person they are. 
Let me tell you something. The longer we play the victim, the more we mock the grace of God. Do you hear me, church? The more that we play the victim, the more we mock the grace of God. How do you get even? Let me throw that question at you. What is, what is enough? I read a story recently about a 17-year-old young man in Washington, D.C. His name's Kevin Trudell. In 2002, he made the biggest mistake of his life. He was at a New Year's party, got very drunk. His friends urged him not to drive, but he insisted. You already know where this story's going. He said, nothing will ever happen to me. It's only two miles. I'll make it home. On the road, he lost control of the wheel, smashed into another car, and instantly killed an 18-year-old girl. He pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter and drunk driving. And he was sentenced to three years of probation, one year of community service. Parents felt like he got off way too easy. And, I'm, and undoubtedly, if I were in that position, if all of us were in that position, it's a horrible situation. The girl's parents understandably said that they, they, that wasn't enough. So they sued him in civil court for emotional distress. They sued him for $1.5 million. The judge said, how do we settle this thing? So he met with the young man and the parents, and their, the parents came up with an idea. They said, okay, you know what, we'll settle the case for $936 with this bizarre condition. It required that Kevin pay the $936 by sending them a check for $1 made out to the deceased girl every single Friday for the next 18 years. One for every year that Susan had been alive. The penalty seemed like he got off easy, so he immediately leaped at that. 936 bucks, I didn't go to prison while I'm on probation, he jumped at that. But soon the burden of guilt became too much for this young man. He tried to present the family with boxes of checks dated for each week, already signed, already made out, they turned it down. They wanted the check, and they wanted it mailed, and they wanted it mailed every single Friday on time. And so Kevin fell behind. And every time Kevin fell behind, they drug, the family, they drug him back into court, and the judge would sentence him to 30 days in jail, 30 days in jail, 30 days in jail. And this went on until Kevin became a broken man. After seven years of, the, of this experiment, he could do no more. He threw himself on the mercy of the court and said, Judge, I can't take any more. I can't keep doing this. I can't imagine what that family went through. I can never imagine what it would be like to bury one of our four daughters, especially killed by a drunk driver. But the question that I want to ask you today is, what is enough? What is enough? Is 930 checks, 936 checks, is that enough for you? Where does it stop? How many payments are you right now? And you're sitting here as you're processing that. I want you to think about the 936 checks that you're extracting right now from somebody in your life. Who are you holding over the barrel day after day, week after week? Something they did to you five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You're not letting go of that pain. You refuse to let go of that hurt. You know, Peter asked Jesus a pretty similar question. In fact, it's the question that prompted the parable that we're studying this morning. Peter came to Jesus and he said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. And then Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven, 77 times. And as Peter stands there with his mouth open, the meaning is clear. Grace does not keep count. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says love keeps no record of wrongs. You know, if you're here with your spouse this morning, I want you to just grab their hand. If you're sitting here in the audience, grab the hand of the person next to you, the significant other, your spouse. And I want you just to turn to that person. If it's your sister or your brother, turn to them and say love keeps no record of wrongs. I'm going to look right at my bride in the back. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Didn't that feel good? Didn't that feel good to just let that go? 
Jesus knew that unforgiveness only keeps the unforgiver in jail. It's like drinking Drano, and yet you hope that it poisons your enemy. It's why Jesus in this story points out two things. Here's the first one. Number one, every one of us has a massive debt that we cannot possibly repay. Every single one of us. A talent, by the way, is about 60 to 80 pounds. It could be either silver or gold. But since Jesus is using an unimaginable debt, let's just say, for the sake of the reference here, let's just say it's gold. It's the equivalent of 60 million working days in this time. So the man's debt is far greater than his ability to pay. He's ordered to be put in jail. Not just him, but his wife and kids have to go with him. Everything was to be sold. But remember, the parable was not about money. It's about forgiveness. And Jesus said when the servant begins to beg for forgiveness before the king, he cancels the debt. And the master takes pity on him and he clears the ledger. All good, right? I want you to imagine if every sin you've ever committed is a talent of debt. I need you to do some personal inventory right now. Stop thinking about the person that harmed you and start thinking about you for a second. Not just the big sins. Please don't say them out loud. But think about every lust, every lie, every time you fudged on something where you knew the truth. Every single time that you participated in gossip, went behind people's backs, little stuff, big stuff. You start thinking about the debt of that. How many of them would there be? Would there be 20,000, 50,000, a million? It adds up. A Sunday school teacher asked a, a group of young students, what is the... First thing, what's the, the one thing you have to do to be forgiven? And little Johnny raised his hand and he said, first, we got to start sinning. <laughs> God's word tells us that every single one of us here have accomplished that. We've all met that first requirement. We've all come in the store today with sin in our lives. All have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God, it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. God is the king in this story. And every single one of us are the first servant when it comes to being in debt caused by our sin. Our pockets are empty and our debt is millions. We don't need a salary. We need a gift. We don't need swimming lessons. We need a lifeguard. We don't need a place to work. We need someone to work in our place. So God paid our debt. He canceled it with his grace on the cross. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He said that he himself bore our sins in his body. He was on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, all of us were healed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. We learned that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The servant master, it says, took pity on him and let him go. Paid in full. Isn't that awesome? Brothers and sisters, that's what the blood of Jesus does for the massive debt that we've incurred. All of mankind, past sin, present sin, Future sin, the wages of sin are death, but Jesus has paid our sin. And yet that transaction releases us from jail. It allows us to escape hell. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. And accepting forgiveness and grace like this, it must change our hearts, right? No. Point number two. If we don't accept that grace... If we don't accept that forgiveness and we don't allow it to change our hearts and our lives, point number two, we end up in a prison that is worse than before. And here's the prison. 
The very worst jail that anybody could find themselves in is an unforgiving heart. You ready, church? Remember this story again. It's about forgiveness. It's almost unbelievable how someone who's been forgiven millions and millions can then go choke another man because he owes him $10. Are these the words of someone who's really been set free? That's my question. Are we really set free when we have that mindset of you're going to pay me or else? It'd be like having your mortgage paid off. Somebody just comes in and says, guess what? Today's the day. I'm going to write you a check for the mortgage. You're free and clear. Wow. And then you got to go pick up some detergent at Walmart. You get in line at Walmart and she shortchanges you by five bucks and you choke her right there. <laughs> And then you call her boss over and you say, man, this woman's got to go. She made a mistake. She's got to pay. That's what the ungrateful servant was. Had him thrown in jail. Interesting that the other servants were saying, hey, wait a minute. That's not logic. And they went to the master. Unforgiveness blinds us. It destroys your witness. If you're here today and you know Jesus, and you have unforgiveness in your heart. You can't be preaching forgiveness in one hand and not be forgiving in the other. It completely eradicates. It destroys your witness for Jesus Christ. I grew up in Florida. We used to hunt rattlesnakes. And even rattlesnakes, when cornered, they can become so irritated they'll bite themselves. And that's exactly what harboring resentment against others is. We just are biting ourselves. We're filling ourselves up with that, our own poison. And it puts us in a jail where torture and chains bind us until that debt gets paid off. Jesus said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and your sister from your heart. No wonder the writer in Hebrews chapter 12 said, verse 15, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. When we miss the grace of God like that first servant, we just trap ourselves right in our own jail. Last week, it's good to be back here at the bridge. I haven't been here for a few weeks. Many of you know that I was back in Florida. Last week, we buried my, my beautiful mother, Jane Gillardy. She was a daughter of, of immigrants. She grew up playing the accordion on street corners while her father, the last of the, the great street preachers in that era, he led people to Jesus, and that's where she started her ministry. She worked her way through college. She was the, the first in her family to earn a college degree. She volunteered for mission trips on single-engine planes that were packed with Bibles and food, and her best stories were about flying across the ocean, single-engine planes. So low that the waves would hit the landing gear while they sang hymns and asked Jesus to get them there safely. She landed a job after her time on the mission field. Landed her first job at the biggest church in Jacksonville, Florida. Working directly with the, one of the largest pastors in the state of Florida. And by all accounts, my mom's trajectory was straight up. It was like she had a one-way flight right to the right hand of God. And then she met my dad. She met and married my dad, and my dad at that time in his life made a bunch of poor decisions. I won't get into it this morning, but he chose another path. And there was my mother, broken, abandoned, two young children to raise. She had a choice to make, bitterness or forgiveness. Bitterness or forgiveness. And I praise God today that my mother chose forgiveness. And in the process, she taught her children and we teach our children that God wastes no pain. When you release that and you let that go, forgiveness is reciprocal. It heals. It changes lives. My mom dove head first into the ministry. By the time she passed away last week, she had shared the gospel of Jesus Christ to thousands and thousands of people. Growing up without my dad would become the driving force behind me becoming a football coach. And be behind our nonprofit ministry that we have today. 
In one of my very last conversations with my mom, I said to her, I said, Mom, you know, what's the biggest difference serving God, you know, now at the age of 90 compared to back then? What, what's the biggest difference? And she said, well, there's definitely a lot less peer pressure. <laughs> but the very last act that my mother performed, the very last words that she spoke on the face of this earth, she led her surgeon to Jesus Christ. He said, are you ready for this? And she said, the question is, are you ready for this? Because you're not going to take me next to the throne if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Here's my question. Who needs to be released today from their unforgiveness? Who do you need to forgive today? Whether it was a drunk driver who killed a family member, a nasty divorce where you thought you'd never recover. Maybe it was a parent that really hurt your feelings. Personal abuse from a co-worker. Rejection of a spouse or a child. All of us can name some time in our lives where we've been hurt, we've been injured, we've been mistreated, we know we've kept score. But what about this? It's inevitable, too, that we've hurt people. We've injured people. We've mistreated people. Forgiveness doesn't always mean that we keep putting ourselves back into bad circumstances with people that are going to hurt us. But forgiveness does require this morning that we choose grace. And we have to want grace for all of those people in our lives. And we have to include them in our prayer life. How about a simple prayer like this? Lord, forgive me for the people that I've hurt. Can you, add, can you have the courage to add this in your prayer each morning? Lord, forgive me for the people that I've hurt, the people that I've wronged, the people that have suffered at my hands or my tongue, something I've said or something I've done. We're so quick to ask God to help us. And we're also just as quick to step over what we've done to others. Just a year after Hurricane Katrina, it was a year or so, I was writing a book with June Jones when he was the head coach at the University of Hawaii. And Lori Beth and I were part of the contingent that went to New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl. And this was not long after Katrina hit. And the week that we were there, we were able to see for ourselves up front, up close, personal. The incredible destruction of, and, and the horrible conditions that that hurricane had caused. When you got just a little bit outside of town, it was still one of the most disgusting situations you'd ever witnessed. They were mucking out houses and filled with unimaginable filth. People covered in, in, in things that you just don't ever want to see. You can never forget it. And you see them walking away with this, this filth and this toxicity. Lori Beth and I couldn't wait to get back and take a shower after that and, and try to get that out of our minds. You know, but those sights and those smells stay with you. And then I think, you know, that must be what we all look like to God. That must be what we look like, what we smell like when we refuse to accept God's forgiveness. When we refuse to forgive others we're just going to hang on to that stench. We're going to stay in our old nasty clothes. We create stench in our relationships and our friendships when we hold on to these unhealthy grudges. We hang on to the past, one of Satan's biggest tricks. He throws the past in your face like an old dead carcass. But what about this? And wants you to go back there and peel that onion again and start remembering who it was and why it happened. And man, that's stifling. It's horrible. And we can be cleansed of that immediately, instantly. Friends, that bitterness and anger is not biblical. It is not Christ-like. Matthew 18, 22, Peter was given an order. And this is what I want you to take home today. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And man, forgiveness, it often accompanies personal pain, but we cannot change the past. It is a choice, despite the pain and despite the lack of trust, we have to let go. 
and holding grudges only hurts us deep in our souls. Forgiving, though, and here's the message, it blesses us forever. True forgiveness will not set any boundaries. True forgiveness will not set any limits. It's a rare gift that we give ourselves and to others. Jesus said to forgive from the heart because only doing so will our hearts experience freedom and healing. I'm going to invite Terry and Nancy to come back up and begin to, to play softly while we just take a quick examination of our hearts. I want to challenge you today to jump into this forgiveness that we've read about this morning. I want you to embrace the joy and the love and the peace that's waiting on you there. In closing, I love the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. We are instructed, listen to this, it says we're instructed to put on kindness, put on gentleness, put on patience, and wait for it, put on forgiveness. Did you hear that? Put it on. That's a verb. It means do it. It's a choice. I'm extending it to you today. Jesus has extended it to you. When you choose this day to put on a new heart, we have this choice to make every single day. And Jesus was our great example. He asked us to go and do likewise. He's asking you to leave here today and go and follow him. He forgave all of us everything that we would ever do against him. And he forgave us, get this, while we were still sinning. How much does he love us? His love for us is measured, folks, from one scarred hand to the other. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would give us the courage today to face our problems, admit and face our part in them, and bring them to the light for your healing. Father God, we, we ask that you give us the strength to follow your example, to forgive others and to forgive ourselves. Lord Jesus, we ask that we keep our eyes focused on you and what you would have us do. In the almighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Lord, goodness. 